Uh, let me add my welcome to that you've already received. Uh, if we haven't met before, I'm Stephen, and it's great to have you here, and really looking forward to hearing a bit of your story. On this Vision Sunday, I want to talk today on what it looks like when the Lord's hand is with you. But before I begin, there were two key moments this week, which I think are not just significant in broader terms, but for significant for us as a church community. And the first is you will have seen the the anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. And I'm sure, like me, you still remember the shock of uh, that invasion beginning and seeing fathers and mothers having to put their children onto buses and onto trains to send them to safety and then turn around and pick up like AK-47s and petrol bombs and get ready to defend their cities against the tanks and the helicopters and the planes which were imminently about to arrive. And it looked completely and utterly hopeless. And lots of people prayed and obviously lots of uh, governments stepped in. And in the midst of all the horror and tragedy of the last year, there has been this extraordinary story of the strength of their spirit as a people and even hope that while freedom has a very high price, there are still today people who are willing to fight for it and evil doesn't have to have the last word. Because sometimes in life, and you might be going through a season like this at the moment, it feels like the enemy is having a field day and it looks like the kingdom of God is in retreat But what we know from the scriptures is that the enemy always overplays his hand and God is a master of turning even what is intended for harm for good. And that was the first thing I was really struck by this week. And then a few days ago, uh, Lily, who uh, is a member of our congregation and uh, works in neuroscience, but on Sundays helps out on our sound desk as a volunteer and uh, mixes the most precise, perfect sounds you could possibly mix with all her neuroscience skills. And uh, she wrote to me about a church in Antioch a church that had suffered as a result of the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and we're going to be supporting them as a church. Um, she, she knows that they've been doing a lot of youth work in that city and seeing people come to faith. And then it struck me, goodness me, that church in Antioch has been there for just shy of 2,000 years. Think of all that has happened in the world in the last 2,000 years. And there are still youth in the city of Antioch who are placing their trust in Jesus as a result of the, in in this church particularly, some of them direct descendants of those who responded to the gospel just shy of 2,000 years ago. And I kind of feel about this church, I think there's been Christian worship on this site for a thousand years, you know, relatively new compared to the church in Antioch, just getting started. And um, they're like, oh yeah, the first thousand years, that's really tough. But you know, the second thousand years, that's, <laughs> once you've got the momentum up, it's much easier. The leadership pipeline's in place, you know, you've got your founders, your backers, you've got, you know. Um, the second thousand years, yeah, it's easy. And, um, but we've been here for a thousand years and extraordinary to see people coming to faith this week, right here. You know, people who first started Christian worship on the site a thousand years ago, I wonder if they would ever have imagined that a thousand years later, people would be coming to faith and placing their trust in Jesus here. I think the church in Antioch is actually really significant for us in understanding what God is calling us to do. And we're going to look at the church in Antioch, we're going to look at this extraordinary passage, because it shows us what it is like when God moves in power in a community, in a city, in a church, when the Lord's hand is with you. And the first thing we see in this passage is that when the Lord's hand is with a community, people encounter Jesus. Now, the followers of Jesus have been scattered by persecution Uh, and as things are challenging for the church in human history what we see is as there is opposition and complexity and difficulty the church grows the blood of the martyrs 
is the seed of the church. And most of those who leave Jerusalem focus only on Jewish people, but some of them, those from Cyprus and Cyrene, go to Antioch. And they speak to Greeks and non-Jewish people and lots of other people, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Very recently, only just a few moments before, Peter has told the apostles, look, I think I've, 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 I've introduced people who aren't Jews to Jesus, and he's met with them, so I think we've got to open the doors a bit wider. And the apostles are like, well, okay, yeah, we think even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. We're happy about that. We're excited about that. But this is the first time people have gone to a place, to a city with the intention, with the hope of witnessing to people from a range of backgrounds and ethnicities and nationalities about Jesus. And Antioch is the perfect place. It's a highly diverse, connected city. It was known as the Rome of the East. There were multiple ethnic groupings, different communities of different cultures coming together in one city. But what they had found over the years was because there were so many cultures mixing up against each other, so many ethnicities, so many nationalities, the authorities of that city kind of practiced a kind of form of zoning. They kind of tried to subdivide the cultures. And you had at least 18 different tribal ghettos within that city. It was no, some of the archaeology shows these walls that are just built up around the city, dividing different people groups from each other, because it was thought that was the easiest way to keep the peace and stop there being too much clashes. And in that context, where there are you know, lots of young people, lots of people exploring new ideas, massive challenges and huge opportunities, the good news about the Lord Jesus is preached. It's told that God has not left us, that he has come to us in the person of his son, that we need rescuing and he's come to redeem us, that by his death on the cross, we might know that redemption, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we might see the whole of this earth renewed and restored and transformed. So when Jesus returns as he will, and we come face to face with him as we will, we can know that we'll stand before the Lord much loved daughters and sons of God and we will inherit eternal life the good news about the Lord Jesus and what we see in Antioch is that led to the creation of a radically diverse and radically united community we know that because in Acts 13 1 to 3 it describes some of the leaders and some of the prophets and some of the teachers in the church in Antioch Lucia who was a Libyan you had Simeon, who's from sub-Saharan Africa. You had Mansion, who was a Palestinian, highly influential. Barnabas, who was from Cyprus. Lots of different leaders, all using their gifts to build and grow the church. In a real sense, what God did in Antioch broke down barriers in the city. And in that city... The only place you would have seen that diversity, the only place you would have seen that age diversity, ethnic diversity, national diversity, cultural diversity, diversity in socioeconomic backgrounds, diversity in educational backgrounds, was in the church that was established by the preaching of the good news about Jesus. And I just want to say God has positioned us at the heart of this global city. The world is here. Over 35% of the people who live in this city were born and raised outside of the United Kingdom. There are over 140 nationalities, multiple ethnicities. We have highly affluent people and people who are living in poverty. We have some of the most influential voices in the world and people who have just got out of prison. We have people who have some of the best education that money can buy in the entire world and a number of people, a significant number of people in our city who have no formal qualifications at all. We have one of the highest proportions of 18s to 25s and 18s to 35s in the nation. And yet we have a range of ages and experiences and backgrounds. And what I love is that in our church, all those different groups are represented and drawn together and that is an amazing thing it's not an amazing thing because anyone else thinks it's an amazing thing it's an amazing thing because it is a definitive undeniable proof that the Holy Spirit is up to something because what the Holy Spirit does is create unity out of diversity 
you go to church, everyone looks the same, everyone sounds the same, everyone's from the same background. You don't know if the Holy Spirit's there. Might be, might not be. Got no idea of proving it though. But if you go to church and there are people from different ethnicities and nationalities and backgrounds and ages, you can say the Holy Spirit is here. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who loves to bring unity out of diversity. That is a sovereign move of God. And what I love about it is it only happens as a result of the preaching of Jesus Christ. And yet when it happens, it in and of itself is a powerful witness to the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And people start to look. And it's happened over the last six months. People who have come to church for the first time look around and they say, what's going on? There are so many different people here from different backgrounds and contexts and yet they are united and they are together and they're forming great friendships. What is it that creates that? And the truth is, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And we see the Lord's hand is with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And that's what I love at the moment. We're seeing people encounter Jesus. We're seeing prison leavers encounter Jesus and business people encounter Jesus. We're seeing mechanics encounter Jesus and postgraduate students encounter Jesus. We're seeing people um, who grew up in nations where it was illegal to speak about Jesus. Coming to this city, hearing the good news about Jesus and turning to Jesus and encountering Jesus, all sorts of people. And I love hearing the stories. Just in the um, last couple of months, a young woman uh, who runs uh, a modeling agency in our city, uh, she, she's kind of uh, a businesswoman, and she runs a modeling agency. If you didn't know there was a modeling agency in our city, um, I can pass on your details if you feel you've been overlooked. You know, why has no one ever approached me at a train station or in a cafe? I can, I can let her know. But um, she runs a modeling agency, and she, uh, not a church girl, not that background, and she was driving into the city, and uh, she was in terrible traffic. And she was going to be late for a meeting with lots of very important clients, and For the first time, she said, in at least 10 years, she prayed a prayer. And she said, God, I need to get to this meeting. If you help me get to this meeting, I'll go to church on Sunday. (laughs) And the traffic parted like the Red Sea. (laughs) She arrived so early to the meeting, she was the first person there. And as she was waiting for the meeting to start, she thought, oh no, I've got to go to church on Sunday. (laughs) And she turned up here, and she sat just over there. And as the service began, she was moved to tears. And she was moved to tears all the way through the service. And she came forward and spoke to me after the service. She gave me permission to say this. And she said, I don't know what's happening to me, but I just feel overwhelmed. And as much as I've ever seen in another human being, the manifest presence of God, the Holy Spirit, was resting on her. It's extraordinary. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And that's what's happened to her. We have um, a gathering of people on on a Monday night for uh, those who might be from slightly more challenging backgrounds and more vulnerable backgrounds in our community. And um, a few weeks ago, a young man, 23 years old, uh, started coming, born and raised in this city, very difficult life, um, spent time in the criminal justice system, and actually had spent some time rough sleeping as well. And he turned up just on a Monday night as a meal and just an opportunity to build community and you know, a bit of, bit of worship uh, and had a brief chat with a guy on our team called Johnny. And he said to him, could someone like me ever really have a second chance? Great question. It's a great question. Johnny said, yes, which is the right answer. <laughs> and then... Two weeks later, um, the guy was back again, and they're having another conversation. And he, Johnny said to him, well, have you thought about, you know, starting a relationship with God, starting a relationship with Jesus? And he said, well, I'm not sure where to begin. And Johnny said, well, why don't, why don't you, you could say a brief prayer, and then ask God to help you with the rest. Which is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so Johnny said, he said, I prayed out loud, and then he looked at the guy, didn't look like there was any impact. She said, oh, maybe I've got this wrong. You know, it's like an open goal. And um, he said, okay, well, we'll see what happens. And then a little while later, the guy prayed his own prayer out loud, asking Jesus to come into his life. And after he'd finished, he said, you know, that's the first personal prayer 
I've ever prayed. And um, after this, the guy just began to beam. And Johnny went to get him some dessert and brought it back. And, and then he said he was giggling with joy as though someone had just told him they loved him. Just a couple of weeks ago. Someone, no experience of church, no background in church. Not particularly aware of the name of Jesus. And apparently the next day he just came around telling people, I've become a Christian. Amazing. It's just happening. You know, on Wednesday night we had um, a little gathering to pray and worship. One of the guys who jumped up on the stage told me that we didn't even have time to talk about it really. He said, oh, you know, I, I had a while when I was wandering off from my faith, but now I've rediscovered my faith and it's so exciting. I really feel like God's met with me. I was like, that's oh, so exciting. Great. I've had to move on to the next person straight away. It's just happening all over this place. I love hearing the stories of people who a few months ago haven't even known the name of Jesus and now that name is precious to them. The Lord's hand was with them and people believed. And we're seeing so many people believe and turn to the Lord at the moment. I'm finding, just a confession for you, I'm finding it quite hard to keep track. You know, one of our student pastors was telling me of stories of people who've been encountering Jesus even in the last few weeks. Is uh, uh, um, someone on uh, Wednesday night? We had this gathering, prayer and worship gathering on Wednesday night, and uh, there was a healing at it. And I don't say that lightly. Um, you know, I'm naturally quite a skeptical person, and we prayed for people to be healed. And um, someone, actually, I know very well. I know her very well. I was doing some filming with her that afternoon. Um, she was being prayed for by a couple of people, and as I walked past, they said to me, "Oh, Joe's been healed." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." And I, they were like, no, she's really been healed. I'm like, I'm sure she's been healed. I'm sure like her pain has gone from a nine to a seven. And I praise the Lord for that. But I'm a bit busy at the moment. You know, and I carried on walking. And they said, no, she's really been healed. I was like, how can she be healed? She's got a broken arm. She got, had a broken arm six days before. Had to go to the JR. Had to go to the hospital. Had it all strapped up. She couldn't move it. Extreme pain for six days. They prayed for her. And then I said, well, is your arm healed? And she said, yes, it's healed. I was like, I woke up next morning, I said to Beth, I said, I hope it's still healed today. <laughs> and I went into work, I said, like, okay? like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Someone, one of the students was so impacted by this. She asked Joe to pray for her, and they said, right, I'm off out. So she went out to a club. I didn't even know there was a nightclub in Oxford. She went out to a nightclub and started speaking to people about Jesus. She spoke to one um, student, and the student said to her, are you, are you a Christian? She said, yeah. She said, oh, well, my, I think my grandma was a Christian, but no one else really. And she said, all right. And she said, uh, would you like us to pray for you? The person said, yeah, in a club. <laughs> and she started to experience the Holy Spirit. And then they said to her, well, would, you like us, would you like to kind of pray a prayer that Jesus comes into your life? The girl said, yes. <laughs> and so they did that right there and then. That was on Wednesday. I'm not very good at maths, but now it's Sunday. That's just a few days ago. It's exciting. The student said, my heart was burning with the fire of God's love for the people we met. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed. You know, I think when you see a lot of people coming to faith in Jesus, it signifies something. It signifies that the Lord's hand is with you. And I think, to think that the Lord's hand is with us is an awesome, amazing thing. I mean, it's amazing to see the fruit of it, but just to realize that the Lord's hand is with you, the Lord's actual hand is with you. The Lord's hand, it signifies his power and his activity in the world and his favor and his grace and his desire and his sovereignty and his authority to influence everything that happens. If the Lord's hand is with you, then anything can happen. If the Lord's hand is with you, then all bets are off. If the Lord's hand is with you, it doesn't matter who's arraigned against you. If the Lord's hand is with you, it doesn't really matter what the obstacles are. If the Lord's hand is with you, anything is possible. Because his hand holds all favor and power and authority and might and grace and redemption. The Lord's hand is with them. And so a number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Sometimes we think we're on our own. 
know, you pray to God like, Lord, we want to see people encounter Jesus. What do you think? God is just standing there saying, it's interesting. <laughs> Tell me how it goes, you know. Try your best. See, see, see if you're any good at it, you know. I'll just watch here. Quite happy. No. The Lord is not passive in salvation. The Lord is not passive in people encountering Jesus. The Lord is not passive in seeing people come to faith. He's active, he's involved, he's on it. And actually the role we are playing is relatively small because the Lord can do whatever he wants to do. Do you want to be honest with you? This is embarrassing for me. I have given seminars on why this doesn't happen anymore to lots and lots of people. I've said, yeah, in the 50s and the 60s, you were kind of reactivating a kind of dormant reservoir of faith. So it's easy for someone to respond to become a Christian. Now, much more complicated. People are much further back. Doesn't happen that way anymore. Turns out it does. (laughs) But it's nothing we can do. It's the power of God by the Lord's hand. When the Lord's hand is with you, people encounter Jesus. When the Lord's hand is with you, secondly, we see that people are raised up as disciples of leaders and leaders. News of what's happening reaches the church in Jerusalem. They send Barnabas to Antioch. He arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. People spend their lives trying to define what discipleship is. This is as good a description of I've ever seen. To encourage you to remain true to the Lord with all your heart. It's what we most need at this time. Courage to be true to the Lord with all our hearts. Courage to be true to the Lord, to live every part of our lives, in every area of our lives, in our workplaces, our friendships, our relationships, in the way we treat people, in the way we speak to people, the way we spend our time in a way that's true to the Lord. Why? Because our motivations come from our hearts. So if I'm true to the Lord with all my desires, all my passions, all my values, the Lord loves you. He wants your best. You can trust him. You'll never regret an act of remaining true to the Lord. So easy thing for other things to come into our hearts to crowd out what the Lord is doing. Knock Jesus off the throne. Sometimes it's subtle, just comes in bit by bit. Sometimes it's obvious and knocks us sideways. But the Lord doesn't want us to have divided hearts. He wants us to be wholehearted. And we need at this time good women, good men, who like Barnabas, described as being full of the Holy Spirit and faith who can teach and invest in people. You know, I find it so exciting that we have over 150 children right now being invested in. It's like bigger than lots of schools. Just think of the potential impact each of those children has as they grow in friendships that might sustain them in their faith, as they grow in the knowledge and love of God. I love the fact that we, we have a youth. You know, I was praying last month for our church and... Um, God gave me a word, I mean, an actual single word. I'm quite slow, I'm not very clever, so God tends to speak to me through single words. It's the word youth. What does that mean? (laughs) I think the Lord wants us to invest more and more in our youth. I had this other phrase, whatever it takes. We're going to do whatever it takes to invest in our youth. Whatever it takes to see this generation that's had such a tough time raised up to be followers of Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes to see people's faith activated and supported, to see great friendships grow. We're going to invest in our youth and in our kids. And we're going to disciple people, people who have come to faith. Hearing on Wednesday about a guy who has just came to faith before Christmas and he's been meeting with a mentor, a good grand mentor, and reading his Bible. He said to me, it's changed my life. We need mature people, people who've been following Jesus for a while, people who've seen a few winters, to invest and support the rising generation and those who are just coming to faith in Jesus Christ. As here we see Barnabas doing, Barnabas and Saul, for a year, they just pour out their lives into the church Antioch, teaching people, discipling people, spending time with people, mentoring people. They raise up leaders, all ages, all ethnicities. And I love that Barnabas takes a chance on Saul, the person we know as the Apostle Paul. Just before this, Barnabas has persuaded the leaders in Jerusalem when they don't want anything to do with Paul. He's persuaded them to take a chance on him. I mean, imagine the job interview. You've got the Apostle sitting there. It's interesting you've applied for a job as an Apostle. Um, What was your most recent role? 
I murdered Christians. Lots of them. I hunted them down as hard as I could. Barnabas was like, give him a second chance. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> Try him out. And then not only does he persuade them to do that, the first time he goes on a mission, he says, come with me. It's all kicking off here in Antioch. We need some people. So come on out. Practice on these guys. Try not to kill anyone this time. <laughs> and for a year, he's supporting him and encouraging as Saul becomes Paul and grows in his giftings and leadership. That's what we want to do as a church. Now, we don't hear loads and loads about Barnabas over this. He's around. He's encouraging people all over the place. Paul writes most of the rest of the New Testament. Barnabas did this again and again. With John Mark, he did it again. Raising people up and pouring himself into them so that it might rise up. You have no idea the chain reaction you might start. You serve on a youth team. You serve in a kids team. You, know, you mentor someone. You welcome someone. My friend who became a Christian, you know, turns up so nervous, hasn't been in church before. It matters that they're welcomed warmly. It matters that they're given a cup of coffee, that someone chats to them. that can make all the difference to someone's life and eternity. Whatever you do, don't underestimate the impact of a small act of obedience. You know, maybe you open your home for a group, you know, Beth and I ran a group all through our 20s. It was rubbish. We were terrible at it. We're working 70-hour weeks. We'd come home, we're like, oh, what should we do? Pizza again, chuck a pizza in. Pity the poor people who had to be in our group. But at least we did it, and we tried, and we made it work, and we were able to invest in people. Don't underestimate the difference you can make. And then thirdly, when the Lord's hand is on a people, we see that people are inspired to transform their city. Little verse in this passage, but it could not be more significant. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. You see the significance of that. Those in their city, those in their region, they become aware of this group of people. It's like the impact they're having in the workplaces, the way they're caring for the poor, the way they're telling people about Jesus, the way they're caring for the sick, the way they're welcoming newcomers, the way they're so unified in purpose but so diverse in background. They become aware of this group of people. And they're like, well, how do we define them? We need a new category. We need a new term. We need some kind of new identity. Because what are they? Well, they're so distinct in the way they live, but they're so immersed in the day-to-day life. that They have bridges between different ages and genders and ethnicities and nationalities and social status, economic status, educational status. What unites them is infinitely greater than anything that might divide them. It's like the city of Antioch, third largest city in the Roman Empire, sits up and takes note and says, how do we define these people? And what they say is, we're going to call them Christians. Because it seems like what unites them, can't be anything else, what unites them is the way they follow Jesus Christ. So they're going to be Christians, those of Christ, those of Jesus. You know, when the world looks at you, it says, we have a career, you have a social status, you have you know, an economic basis, but I can't define you primarily by that. Oh, oh, you have a nationality, you have an ethnicity, that's really important. We know in the new creation, ethnicity is not eliminated, it's celebrated. People from every tongue and tribe and nation gather around the throne. But I can't define you primarily by that. Oh, you have a relationship status, you might be single, you might be going out with someone, you might be married, but I can't define you primarily by that. There's something different about you then you know you are making a difference. You're living in a different way. You're motivated by a different passion. You're distinct. And that is obvious to the people around them that they are bound together by the love of Jesus Christ. Think of the difference we could make. As we realize that the Lord's hand is with us, as we reach out with boldness to those around us and invite them to encounter Jesus, as we pour our lives into discipling those who are coming to faith and the generation that's rising up and those who maybe have been following Jesus for a long time but they've just got a bit stuck and, and need to fire up their passion for Jesus. As inspired by the Holy Spirit, we go out into our workplaces and our hospitals and our businesses seeking to be known as followers of Jesus Christ, living in a way that is compelling and distinct. Think of the difference we could make. 
and what the Lord might do. The Lord's hand is on you. In Jesus' name, amen.